Greetings everyone, I'm Adam Harriton. Welcome to the beautiful woods of Western Pennsylvania. Today we are going to discuss an important topic that many people wonder about, and perhaps you've wondered about it too. The topic is ticks. Specifically, why are there so many ticks today? If you spend a lot of time outside, especially in Eastern North America, maybe in an ecosystem that looks like this, you might encounter ticks literally every month of the year. And this isn't necessarily something to brag about. Ticks are capable of carrying all kinds of pathogens that can cause a wide variety of human diseases, which is why being bitten by a tick is a pretty serious matter. And because ticks are so prevalent today, the risk of acquiring a tick-borne illness is greater than it has ever been. But here's the interesting thing. It hasn't always been like this. I commonly hear from people who say that when they were growing up, they spent a lot of time outside, but they never really encountered a lot of ticks and they didn't know anyone who regularly encountered ticks or acquired any kind of tick-borne illness like Lyme disease. And maybe your experiences are similar. Maybe you remember never really seeing too many ticks or hearing anything about ticks until relatively more recently. So what happened? Why are there more ticks today than there were even just a few decades ago? What changed? What factors contributed to this population explosion? Did the US government have something to do with this? Or did this all happen by chance? Well, these are all great questions and we are going to answer them in the context of ecology because ecology points us in the right direction. The explosion in the tick population seems to have something to do with how ecosystems in Eastern North America have changed. How have they changed? Well, before we answer that important question, we have to understand something about tick biology and the kinds of conditions that favor tick abundance. And because I live in the northeastern United States where deer ticks are the most abundant tick species, we are mostly going to highlight deer ticks or black-legged ticks in this video. The life cycle of a deer tick typically takes two years to complete and it involves four stages, egg, larva, nymph, and adult. After the eggs hatch, ticks require blood meals from various mammals, birds, and even lizards to move through their life cycle. Now a major cause of tick mortality is desiccation or drying out. This is why ticks spend a lot of time in leaf litter on the forest floor where moisture levels are high. When ticks crawl out of the moist leaf litter and climb vegetation, they put themselves at risk of desiccation in exchange for the potential reward of finding a host. Ticks are also susceptible to extreme temperatures, particularly freezing temperatures. This is why ticks overwinter in leaf litter. The dense litter and additional snow cover provide insulation and protection from drying out. So adequate humidity levels, moisture, leaf litter, lots of vegetation to climb, a steady supply of blood meal hosts, these are the kinds of conditions that favor tick abundance. And it's no surprise that these are the kinds of conditions that have become much more common in many forested ecosystems in Eastern North America. How did this happen? Well, before we answer that important question, we have to understand what the landscape of Eastern North America looked like centuries ago. A lot of people think that Eastern North America at the time of European settlement was a vast unbroken expanse of nothing but dense, dark, old growth forested ecosystems. But this isn't entirely accurate. Wetlands like marshes were common. Tall grass prairies and grasslands were common. Native American villages and cultivated fields were common. And while wooded ecosystems were certainly abundant, their composition and structure were much different than they are today. Prior to European settlement, many, not all, but many treed landscapes in Eastern North America, rather than being dense, dark, closed canopied ecosystems, were often more like woodlands, savannas, and open forests where ample sunlight could reach the ground level, supporting the growth of herbaceous, rich understories. Why were many of these landscapes open? Well, they were open because they were periodically burned by low to moderate intensity fires from lightning strikes and also from human activity, specifically from indigenous burning practices. Indigenous people burned a lot of land and their burning practices kept a lot of forests open, relatively dry, and dominated by fire adapted trees like oaks, chestnuts, and pines. Now things certainly changed with the arrival of Europeans. Many indigenous land use practices either stopped completely or were significantly altered. But fire, interestingly, continued to be a common occurrence, at least for a few centuries. 
But it wasn't just fire that kept many landscapes open in the centuries following European settlement. Intensive deforestation for agricultural clearing and timber extraction further contributed to the openness of eastern North America. But even these activities were linked to fire, since logging slash and brush were often intentionally burned to clear land or were accidentally burned by sparks from passing locomotives. All of these conditions that I just described characterizing many former ecosystems in eastern North America helped to control tick populations. Compared to current conditions, conditions in many of these former ecosystems were relatively drier, they were more open, they received more sunlight, they allowed more wind into the understories, they prevented the significant accumulation of leaf litter and debris, and they prevented tick populations from becoming too numerous. Now other factors certainly helped to control tick populations. Market hunting throughout the 1800s in North America led to a significant reduction in the number of white-tailed deer, which were and still are primary blood meal hosts for ticks. In the early 1900s, a fungal disease known as chestnut blight decimated nearly every large American chestnut tree in eastern North America, leading to an opening of forest canopies and a reduction in populations of chestnut consuming animals, some of which were and still are blood meal hosts for ticks, including eastern chipmunks and white footed mice. But things eventually started swinging, surprisingly, the other way. At the turn of the 20th century, a significant shift from wood to coal and other fuels in eastern North America reduced the demand for timber. This, along with lumber being harvested from other parts of the country, allowed eastern forests to regrow. This reversal of deforestation was further amplified by a second wave of forest regrowth following the abandonment of agricultural land after World War II. And right around this time, improvements in wildfire control and a cultural move away from burning initiated an unprecedented era of fire suppression that was heavily supported and led by the U.S. federal government, ultimately resulting in the loss of fire-dependent ecosystems and the subsequent proliferation of fire-sensitive forests in eastern North America. Ecologists have a fancy word to describe this conversion of relatively dry fire dependent ecosystems into moist fire sensitive ecosystems. It's called mesofication. Mesofication is associated not only with a change in forest composition, it's associated with a change in forest structure, it's associated with an amplification of tick hosts, and it's associated with an increase in tick numbers. When fire is removed from a fire dependent ecosystem, lots of woody plants move in. Some of these woody plants might include fire sensitive trees like maple, beech, and black cherry. Over time, these fire sensitive trees largely replace the fire dependent trees, and the entire ecosystem functions differently. Forests that have undergone mesification tend to be denser, they tend to be darker, they tend to be much more thickly stocked with understory woody vegetation, they tend to have more leaf litter, and they tend to be moister and cooler. These conditions favor ticks and their hosts. And this is why mesification, according to ecologists, has been linked to the explosion in tick numbers over the past several decades. But of course, this shift away from fire dependent ecosystems doesn't fully explain why numbers of ticks have risen so drastically in the past several decades. Over the past 50 years or so, increased residential and commercial development has fragmented forests, and I'm sure you see this happening all the time. What this results in is more edge habitat and smaller forest patches that concentrate tick populations and their hosts, including white-tailed deer, whose numbers, with the help of hunting regulations, have grown tremendously in many areas. Forest fragmentation has also had a negative impact on predators of tick hosts that rely on large, unbroken tracts of land to hunt and find mates. So many factors have contributed to the explosion in tick numbers in recent decades. And while it's difficult to say which factor is the most important, land use changes, some of which we discussed in this video, certainly seem to play important roles. And what these land use changes have done for ticks is that they've increased the availability of their habitat and food. And if there's plenty of habitat and plenty of food and relatively few predators, then of course tick populations will thrive. 
can fire help in this situation? I think so. I don't think fire is the only thing that can help, but at least in ecosystems that were formerly fire dependent, reversing the mesification process with prescribed low to moderate intensity burns, maybe along with some mechanical thinning and intentional planting, I think can help to create the kinds of changes many of us would like to see. Healthy trees, healthy understories, healthy ecosystems, abundant game animals, thriving bobwhite quail populations, and a reduction in the number of ticks. Sounds pretty good to me. Thanks so much for watching this video. I truly appreciate it. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something. If you'd like to support this channel, please subscribe to the Learn Your Land YouTube channel. Head on over to learnyourland.com, sign up for the email newsletter so that we can stay in touch, and check out my online courses on ecology, tree identification, and mushroom foraging. Thank you for watching this video. I will see you on the next one.